Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Behind the Human. I'm your host, Mark Champagne, and it's my job to unpack the stories and mental fitness practices of the people living at the top of their game personally and professionally. And we definitely have one of those individuals on the show today. We have James, who is the CEO of Argonon, one of the UK's top international independent production groups. The group is headquartered in London with hubs in New York, Los Angeles, Oklahoma, Liverpool, and Glasgow. Founded by James, the group has won more than 125 international awards, including Emmys, BAFTAs, and Royal Television Society Awards, and encompasses nine world-class production companies. During his tenure at Argonon, he has had to deal with a variety of existential crises. Through them all, he's managed to guide his team out the other side successfully. Whether it's been the credit crunch or terror attacks, recessions, natural disasters, pandemics, the TV industry has felt the strain of these recurring events like all of us. And each time, James has put strategies in place in order to be prepared for the next time something like this happens. And this is the best line and, and very relevant because it will happen again. I think we just need to be realistic that we're always going to be dealing with something and, and not kind of stick our head in the sand. So, James, it's a real honor to have you on the show. The topic is so is so important because we we all have to deal with this. And we I, I don't if we can't handle these kind of situations or have good mental models good business principles and practices, then we just, we can't show up as our, our best selves and put out, you know, work that has, has global impact. So thank you. Who are you? Well, I am a, uh, a man who grew up in London and I have a wonderful family in both London and New York. Um, so I have worked for many, many years across the Atlantic. Um, I am a program maker by training. I started out as a journalist uh, and then became a program maker. We make programs from everything from documentary to current affairs to entertainment and scripted drama. And I think one of the biggest achievements of my life has been to create an environment within the television industry, which is, let's be honest, um, an ocean of sharks. <laughs> but within that are many, many beautiful, exotic fish and wonderful yeah. talents. <laughs> And I wanted to create a working environment, which is about people. Uh, you know, business is not a p and Business is a, is a company of people. Mm -hmm. And I know, I love creative people. I work with incredible talent all over the world. And when creative people feel nurtured and valued and looked after, they do exceptional things. Mm -hmm. And we can change the world with creative work, whether it's drama, or whether it's a current affairs film or an investigation, or even an entertainment show. We can change the way by how we tell the story, how we cast it. Is it diverse? Is it, is it is inclusive? Can we produce it in a way which is uh, mindful of sustainability and the environment? We can do so many things. So I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is that I'm now 20 years into running this group, surrounded by an incredible team of generals and uh, and uh, talent and, and uh, production staff at every level. Um, where we have um, a people-first culture and people feel valued and looked after and therefore can do their best work. And that, for me, you know, we've employed probably more than 10,000 people over the years, and that's a lot. We've put food on the table, we've fed children, we've paid for people's mortgages, we've helped people do exceptional work. And that is something I'm very proud of. Yeah. Who do you... Who... Who instilled some of these values in you early on as you were coming up in the industry to you know, put the people first and to really step back in and think, and most likely you're probably seeing the contrast of this is not what I'm going to do. And I'd like to go down this route uh, in certain situations, but I'm curious, you know, if there are any people or situations or companies that were helpful for you early on in your career that essentially instilled this, this foundation that I think everyone within the, the nine companies are, are feeling. Uh, well, certainly my dad um, was a very powerful influence. He's no longer with us now, but he was a mm -hmm. filmmaker at the BBC, made documentaries. He was actually a BBC life for 35 years at the BBC, wow. would you believe it? Um, but he was a professional who did a number of things. Um, one, he had an absolutely inherent sense of justice and compassion. And that sense of justice has stood me well. It's one of the great gifts that he bequeathed to me. 
um, compassion, understanding people, being able to put yourself in the shoes of other people and understand people who are different from you, who maybe have different opinions from you, people who are more fortunate and people who are less fortunate. To be able to really empathize, I think, is one of the greatest gifts of any human being can have. Um, and I think that, you know, over the years, I have met some extraordinary people, um, uh, men and women, uh, both in my industry and outside the industry, who have shared those values of justice and compassion. And those, mm. for me, are absolutely driving forces in my life. I wanted to ask you about, before we, we really jump into the, well, this is probably a good intro into the, the topic of the book and, and the main topic, I guess you could say, for our conversation. Is there, is there a certain crisis that sticks out for you that, re, that, that shook your mind the most, where it really, you know, tested everything that, that you've got in terms of the, the training and having gone through multiple different situations like this, but where it really kicked you back and said, okay, this is, you know, buckle up. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Just, yeah, let me know what, what, what that was. And, and I guess the, 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 the second question to that, what, what were some of those feelings and how did you take that first step? The flexible method actually dates back to really starting to be formalized in the credit crunch. Mm -hmm. So 2008, when we were faced with, you know, a complete meltdown. Uh, it felt like, you know, the whole capitalist system was about to collapse, let alone my little company, Leopard Films, as it was called at that time. Um, so that was an existential threat to us because, of course, in my business, which is television and film, we depend upon advertising revenue. So when advertising revenues collapse and people have no money in their pockets, commercial channels, streamers didn't exist at that point back in mm -hmm. 2008, but the big commercial networks didn't have any money. And we were told that there might be no business for a year or more. When, we, and when there's no production, we have no money to pay our bills. We can't employ our people. We can't put food on the table. So it was an existential threat. And I remember at the time thinking, how on earth are we going to get through this? This was back in just kind of the holidays, just before, at the end of 2008, uh, eight, beginning of nine, wasn't it? And I remember reading an article that Richard Branson, the very brilliant international entrepreneur, you know, of course, he wrote in the Times, which was, whatever happens in a crisis, you must do your best to hold on to your people. Mm. Because things will change, things will turn around. If you let everybody go, you will be, frankly, in deep trouble. Yeah, It will also send a completely wrong message to the industry that you are happy to bail out and dump your people when things get tough. And in the long term, that is obviously completely deleterious to any business and reputation, just morally wrong, frankly, as well. So the first thing I did when I, uh, I woke up on the you know, 3rd of January and called my senior team, about 40 people together, into the office in London. And I said to people, listen, you know, capitalism may be about to collapse. Our industry is you know, it's seriously in trouble. Thank goodness we do have some long running returning series. So shows like Cash in the Attic and Missing. And these are shows that, you know, we sell to 167 countries around the world. Very popular, long running reality and lifestyle programming, which thank goodness is the sustainable bedrock of our business. So I was able to say to our people, listen, we're not going to let you go. We are going to protect all of your jobs. But what we're going to ask you to do is two things. We're going to ask you to roll up your sleeves and be willing, if necessary, to step down one notch. If you're a showrunner, we're going to ask you to be a producer director, which is something mm. you used to do two or three years ago, although you left it behind. If you're a show, if you're a producer director, we may ask you to go back into edit and become an edit producer, edit producer down to AP and so on. And we're going to ask you to go back on the road, maybe shoot shows in a way that you haven't done before, uh, pick up a camera again, and we will keep you working. We won't be able to bring in freelancers. But, but at least yeah. we will protect you and your jobs. Um, and the other thing we're going to ask you to do is we've got to get 25% more creative. We've got to think outside the box. So again, we've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to go and talk to clients. One thing we did is we scanned the horizon, and this is critical in any crisis, to see where is there, where is there a glimmer of hope indeed in business? Where is there a glimmer of money 
Yeah. And one of the places, of course, was the BBC. And the BBC is not a commercial network. It has funding directly from the government. And there is one part of the BBC that we weren't at that time working for, which is CBBC, Children's BBC. We thought, well, hang on a minute. Okay, so they do have money. Everybody else is completely broke and not going to commission for any time soon. But maybe CBBC is somewhere we'd go and talk to. We've been quite snobby about doing children's programs. It's not really our bag. But you know what? Maybe we could. So I sent my scripted team in to see uh, the CBBC, and they came up with three ideas, scripted ideas, all of which were immediately rejected because they were not <laughs> right. We were <laughs> green, right? We were starting out. So that was a bit of a downer. But like, okay, back to basics. Let's come up with something else. So we went back in again. And uh, my executive producer at the time, who was pursuing this path, for which we really didn't know what the outcome might be. We just had hope in our hearts and we yeah. were working hard. And um, he came up with this very brilliant idea called Eve about a robotic artificial intelligence young girl who wakes up in a suburban part of the UK uh, in a family and she's uh, 11 or 12 years old and has no history and her family don't know where she came from. And it's like a coming of age of a young girl in a community um, for this um, artificial intelligence um, who, 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 who has no life experience, but she's going to have to learn everything on the job. Anyway, it became a huge hit. It won a Royal Television Society Award, and it opened up a significant new business revenue stream for us as a group. We started making kids and family programming, and arguably on the back of that, later on, we did Words of Gummage, which is a big BBC, BBC uh, family show. And then indeed the Masked Singer, you know, that crazy family oh. entertainment show on ITV on a Saturday night. You know, yeah. we developed a new expertise, which is we know how to make great shows that kids and families are going to love. So yeah. by having that lateral thinking, by opening our mind, by rolling up our sleeves, by working really hard, by being humble and putting mm -hmm. the work in, we opened up a new, a new business stream which yeah. actually has transformed our business and is now a very important our business. Here we are 13 years later. So fascinating. I mean, the, the, the mental fitness practitioner in me thinks, well, the only way that could have worked is exactly what you did in the sense that you set, there was, there was an element of safety for the team because of that first conversation, right? Sure, you know, people are, are moving around in terms of their... Uh, their their position, but but you still have a job, and I think that's where doesn't matter whether it's a uh, in this situation or other situations. As soon as we're in this state of massive fear and anxiety, it's it's nearly impossible to come up with your best ideas or any ideas, frankly. Right? You're, you've got to push through all of this noise. Yet for for whatever reason. We, we still kind of hang on to that notion that, okay, no, we're just, we're going to keep going, get everyone in the room and, you know, put things on flip charts and stuff like that. And, and just basically hope that, you know, something comes up. But if we would just spend a bit of time, like kind of like what you, what you describe and what you've been doing and what's laid out in this book as well, just working on setting the right mindset and, and working with some, some real human emotions right, or addressing those human emotions, given, you know, we are humans. I mean, that just sets the stage then to, you know, go whatever path that, that you're, you're trying to lead the team down. That's absolutely really. right. And, it, and it, you know, when we fast forward to COVID, the first thing that we knew we had to do is move early, which is not what our government did. Yeah. And we made sure that uh, we got 1,500 logins off-site and online within 48 hours in early March 2020. Yeah, and the you were first something, thing we wasn't said, it, you were like 10 days ahead of yeah, something like that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah we we moved very early, um, which felt terrifying, but um, yeah. I took advice from my team um, and people felt fearful. And we made sure that people went home, that the kids were safe, that elderly parents had food in the fridge, that people needed to take time out because they themselves were worried about health and, you know, we were all terrified about flying germs and goodness knows what. So the first thing we did is we made sure that everybody was at home and safe and protected. Mm. And then we very quickly set up communication lines. And of course, a lot of people in my industry in their 20s don't have good Wi-Fi. They are frightened. They're sometimes living in rented accommodation with a couple of friends in a foreign city. Yeah. We made sure that 
very quickly, I was sending out daily communications and that we, we cascaded that down to the business so everybody had a line manager they could talk to. And we said very clearly to people, we do not have all the answers. We're not going to, you know, boosterism here has no part. We're not going to pretend everything's going to be okay because that immediately loses credibility and it's not true. Yeah. However, as a management team, we are all talking. We've got your back. We're listening very carefully to the science. We listen very carefully to those in government who are credible. And we <laughs> will come up with solutions. And little by little, you know, initially it was hour by hour, then it was day by day, then week by week. And little by little, we started just incrementally to kindle hope, to start monitoring what little things we might be able to do, uh, uh, share that around the group so there was a sense of collaboration and community working together with a common purpose. And you know what, Mark, what was incredible is that everybody rolled up their sleeves. People worked all the hours that God sent and came up with extraordinary ideas. Mm -hmm. And they did that because they're passionate, they care, they know they're part of a community of people and we were doing it together. Yeah. I I wrote down, this is, this is from the book, in that moment when when things were starting to lock down and essentially found your place yourself in this place again of, wow, like everything I've just built is this, you know, is, is this it? Is this, is this the, the event that's going to take down these, these companies? And, you, and I wrote down, you said you, you felt powerless and disoriented, uh, which I think many of us did for you personally. What, what were some of the practices or, or rituals you know, any or activities that that you had to deploy for yourself to even get to that point where you can then speak w with the team and and start having you know clear thought and okay, this is the, this is the path we're going to try out. Is there anything that were you know anything that was a good staple for you? If, if we say in the in the business domain initially, um, I mean, I've done quite a lot of study about leadership. I've done some study at Stanford, in California, at Oxford, and most recently, actually, MIT as well. I'm a real believer in training. Um, all of these very um, extraordinary places talk about leadership as being something that is 360. It's in the round. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not professionals living in a bubble. We live in a world which is multidimensional where we have families, we have obligations, we have health, we have to eat, we need to exercise, and we need to take tough decisions and listening to our people and sometimes yeah. overriding those decisions and sometimes making decisions that somebody else has come up with, which is better than what you thought of. You know, you, you need a lot of humility, actually, as a leader. So I think what's really important is to, at the beginning, when the crisis hit, you know, I was living, I moved with my partner to a house in the, in the, our house in the countryside, locked all the office, everybody was at home. And it felt like, my goodness, you know, I've spent 20 years building this business. It's all going to go to pot and we'll end up with nothing, which was obviously very frightening. Plus, of course, you know, we were so fearful for, you know, my elderly parents and I've got mm -hmm. very dear nephews and nieces who were so frightened, who I'm very close to, and so on. And that's in my, you know, my personal world. Um, something that felt very important right from the get-go was to set a routine. Yeah. And I did that from day one. So I did make sure that, you know, I and my partner and people around me were getting up, that we had food on the table, that we were eating properly, that we were exercising. Initially, we were allowed to take one walk a day. So making sure that the very basics of life are ticking over. And then with regard to the business, I knew it was really important for me to come to my desk which is in a spare bedroom because I was not at work, switch on the computer at nine o'clock in the morning and sit there, shaved, looking as fresh as I could, properly yeah. dressed, looking professional and credible. And people could see me and they knew that I was showing up. And my team did that. I remember we had a, a, a laugh with my uh, chief operating officer and, and she said, uh, you know, every day I put on my perfume ready for the computer. And you know what? I, <laughs> yeah. I put my cologne on too because I wanted to feel good. Yeah. You know, these well, things are important. You need to show up and you need yeah. to respect your people you're talking to and respect yourself. Yeah. So that I do take that, that 360 approach to leadership very, very seriously. And I talk about it a lot in the book. Yeah. Well, and I think even, you know, even more important during times of crisis, but these are, these are things that, 
you know, even if you are working from home a certain amount of days or whatever it is or what, whatever the circumstance, I think the theme is set yourself up in your environment and, and with routines with that will make you feel good. And, and, you know, also I think boost confidence and all of the, all of the stuff that is ultimately ends up helping us be, you know, the best versions of ourselves personally and professionally, but we overlook those things often and just kind of get stuck in the rat race of, of process in the day to day that those small little details, which you, how you, you put very well are, are incredibly important. So important. I'd love to talk a little bit about this, just, and, and this came up from our first conversation when we, we first met, but I, I wrote this down and it, it really struck me, but you know, the theme is around some of the stuff that you've been talking about around innovation and, and creative thinking. And I think that giving that extra 25% to think a bit differently. Um, and it links to well being as well, where I, I think the context was looking at the the travel of employees within the company and and looking at okay well we know that when when people are traveling a lot you know first of all i mean there's a cost to that of course but then there's there's also you're away from your your family and your loved ones and so forth and it's tiring there's jet lag well what if we you know boosted partnerships locally within these areas where you're filming and 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 doing production and whatnot i'm just curious like is there as a, as a company and, and as a leadership team, do you have certain moments throughout the year where you're, you're, you kind of zoom out and take a look at, okay, well, here are some of the pain points and let's, let's put the, the thinking hat on to see if we can get creative here. All the time. Uh, <laughs> I'm constantly having conversations with my leadership team and others, you know, in, in the ranks across. I, I love connecting. In fact, you know, the one of the, the most important building uh, rooms in any of our buildings in LA, New York, London, Liverpool, or Glasgow is the kitchen. Mm. You go make yourself a cup of coffee and you catch up and a receptionist tells yeah. you something you'd never thought of or somebody yeah. tells you a show they've just watched or a piece of news that they've just heard. You pick stuff up. So it's very important to be connected in that way. Um, so, yeah, to, to your point, crises can actually be an amazing opportunity because they force you in a very radical, dramatic way to confront your demons. And I, I talk about open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of COVID, we had to do open heart surgery on the business because we had to look from top to bottom about what could we do, what could we not do, and take tough decisions about everything moving forwards. One of our biggest shows is House Hunter International, which is on pretty much every night on HGTV. As you know, it's a very, very popular, much loved mm -hmm. program. I'm very proud of it. We were told uh, in March 2020 that, of course, all production must shut down. Now, there are hundreds of people that work on that show and millions of people around the world that love it and regard it as yeah, comfort myself. and something that makes them feel good. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a broadcaster. I take that responsibility. And we knew that in the middle of COVID, people needed to have touch points where yeah. their friends on TV could still talk to them. So we knew that we needed to try and try and find a way. I also have a very strong social conscience. I've talked to you about diversity and inclusion and also climate change. These things matter. We have to take responsibility in the way we operate to make sure mm -hmm. these things are put into action. So with House Hunters International, the first thing we did, and we gathered our team around us, the small team, uh, we looked at how on earth can we get that into production? And we realized that uh, lockdowns around the world were fluctuating and that one day, Sweden would open up. The next day, South Korea would open up. The next day, Germany would close down, but Spain would open, and so on. And it was happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. So I put together a team who started tracking on a daily basis where lockdowns were opening and where they were coming back down again. And we shifted production to those places. Simultaneously, uh -huh. what we did is we realized that we were no longer going to be able to fly people all over the world. In fact, my Chief, uh, one of my uh, leading executive producers, was pregnant at the time, based on the East Coast in the US. Um, so there's no way she could fly anyway, but even less so with uh, COVID restrictions. Um, so she and the team started to look at, there must be good quality filmmakers around the planet that we could connect with. This is an opportunity to upskill. 
So yeah. why don't we look in Guatemala? Why don't we look in South Korea? Why don't we look in parts of Africa? Why don't we look in parts of the South Pacific and see if we can find producers, directors, fixers, showrunners who we can train up. We can connect with them using WhatsApp. We can connect with them using uh, FaceTime and any other possible yeah. you know, cloud resource <laughs> to, to speak to people. And you know what? She started filming in different parts of the planet, lo- working with local crews. But of course, on those first shoots, she had some very, very specific. They were doing a- action sequences using drones in Guatemala at one point. Wow. Crew that never, never produced primetime American television. And we got to April, and I'm the executive, one of the executive producers on that show. And the, the first rough cut came in, and my heart was going, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is this going to look like? And I was like, please, please let it so good, because it's got to be really high production values. Yeah. Nothing less will do. I looked at the show, and within the first 30 seconds, I could not tell the difference. It was incredible what wow. they did. Wow. It looked slick it was entertaining it was funny the action sequences worked. the drone shot looked spectacular so you know what is the outcome well one we were able to produce that show in the middle of a pandemic because we were flexible globally mm-hmm. two we have massively trained up a hundred crews around the planet to now produce prime time american television yeah three our crews as you rightly said they're not permanently strung out with jet lag And it's much better for the climate. We are saving thousands of air miles every year, which has got to be a good thing. So painful, yes, we have our war wounds, absolutely. But in many ways, we've improved our business practice thanks to COVID. Yeah, well, yeah, and and as you just described, I mean, think there's a massive net positive there. Not to mention, I can only imagine um, for the team, the, the environment, like just the environment of that kind of ideation and trying and seeing something succeed like that, there's, it's, it's hard to measure that, that, but that's, that's a pretty, that's a motivator, right? Like you, there's a ripple effect to when people's minds are in that, that state of, wow, we tried something completely different. It worked, you, you know, then the next thing starts to come up and, and other ideas start to surface. And uh, it's just a beautiful, like I said, ripple effect of, of innovation and possibility and, and not to mention, we feel good doing it, right? It's, um, yeah, it's powerful stuff. What do you, th- I mean, there's so much in, in, in the book. I mean, obviously I'm going to put the, uh, the link in the show notes and, and so forth. And once again, congratulations in, in, in putting this together. I've, uh, my copy's got a lot of highlights, let's just say, in terms of practical tools and, and good questions. You know, I think those who know me well know that I'm a big fan of questions, but really good questions to think about especially to think about when you're not in the middle of a crisis and taking some time, and you can do this personally as well, to map out, okay, what's, what's the plan so that, you know, you can save some mental real estate and some mental horsepower to just execute in, in those moments, right? So my question is, I mean, it's hard to sum it all up, obviously, in, in kind of one line, but I guess I can position a question like this. What, what do you want people to get out of the book when they're finished and, and, and how do you want them to feel? First and foremost, a sense of hope. Mm. There is always hope. The book starts and ends with the same thing, prepare. So we must be practical now. And as you started, we have to be pragmatic and say, yes, there will be another pandemic or something like it, something probably we haven't anticipated. And it will, and it will come. But we must prepare. We must prepare ourselves, and we must prepare our teams. So, in the book, I talk a lot about game planning, and you know, having those really difficult conversations, and saying to your team now, when things feel somewhat more stable, we're going to have a meeting about you know d- disaster recovery, which is obviously a horrible invitation to receive. <laughs> exactly. you've, got, you've, you've, you've got to do this stuff, and if you are well prepared in advance, then you will be okay. Yeah. And as I said earlier in the conversation, you know, I wrote the book to be a manual. I wrote it to be purposeful. I want people to come back to me and share their insights. I've interviewed many incredible leaders in the book from across all sectors, from politics to medicine to um, gyms to hospitality to mm-hmm. events to the arts, culture, uh, agriculture. You know, I wanted people to be represented in all industries in the book because, of course, yeah. there were 
great innovative leaders who came up with incredible ideas, all of whom actually were practicing in their own way, their own version of the flexible method. So I want people to come back to me and share with me. I'm really very uh, noisy on LinkedIn and I love receiving feedback because we're all in this together. You know, I don't have all the answers. There are many leaders in the book who have some great answers, which I've tried to collate so that they are now in one place that people can reach for. Um, But there there will be others who have much better ideas that we haven't thought of. And the book is published by Hachette, who want these books to last and be updated. And I'd like feedback. So I really hope this will become a dialogue. Yeah, I do. I mean, the one thing I was going to say, and and of course, you know, there's always good value in, in, in updating the editions and new ideas coming in and so forth. But I would say in general, the situations may change, but the principles that you're speaking of and the questions to ask and the things to, to speak about are very much evergreen, which I think that is something that, you know, it's one of those books where it's on the shelf and ideally you're, you're picking it up and doing it prior to a crisis. But if you find yourself in one as well, okay, that's the first one. I'm, I'm picking this book. I'm picking something on really good mindset. And then I'm making sure my practices are dialed in. Like, this is it. That's all that's in my bag. <laughs> right? That sounds, sounds good to me. I wrote it to be useful. Yeah, it, it very much is. Uh, one thing I'd like to wrap on is, and I forget the language used in the book, uh, and, and you feel free to, to, to correct uh, the language, but basically it's around just kind of scanning the horizon of what's happening. Yeah. Is it heed, heed something? I think it is how you, how you put heed it. Heed the signs. Heed the signs. Yes. That's what it was. I, but essentially, you know, scanning the horizons of, of present day and seeing, okay, there's some stuff happening here. And just, I think priming the mind and the team to start thinking about these situations and where they could go. You know, we're, we're, we're going to release this somewhat uh, quite soon. So it's, 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 it's timely in the sense of any event that you may bring up. But what, what are the things that you're looking at right now that you're keeping an eye on that you think others maybe should take a closer look as well? It's absolutely essential that we remain engaged in what's happening in the world um, because the world is now so connected. The idea that, uh, I mean, we have Brexit in the UK, the idea that a country can sort of float off in this kind of royal sovereignty and independence is just, it's a fantasy. We are so massively interconnected as a planet, both politically and financially. Um, And you look at the credit crunch, for example, you know, we knew that when the subprime market was collapsing in the US, we knew that the tsunami was going to come. And of course it did. Just a few weeks later, it hit the rest of the world. Um, similarly with COVID, you know, we were watching what happened in Asia. As mm-hmm. soon as it came across both to the uh, North America and then indeed to Europe, we knew in, in the UK that it was coming. There was no way to avoid it. These yeah. things are, you know, we, we as a planet are massively interconnected. So it behoves us as leaders, whether we're leaders of our families or indeed of businesses, it behoves us to be really mindful and, and keep informed. So, of course, right now we have been dealing with chronic inflation across the planet, which has made cost of living extremely difficult. In the UK, we have a million children living in destitution. The poverty at the bottom end of the scale, we're seeing this in many, many developing countries, the, 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 those who have and those that do not have is getting wider and wider and more and more extreme and more painful. We have to be mindful of this. Because it's going to affect all of us. We all pay taxes. We're all part of an ecosystem that has to sustain itself. You know, not just morally do we have an obligation to make sure that we take everybody with us. We also have to make sure that there are people who have access to opportunity, political opportunity or jobs or medical aid. So, it, you know, we do have to be, um, to have to retain our social conscience and I would really like to encourage people to, to, to make sure that they're keeping an eye on what's happening in the world of climate change, what's happening in the Middle East, uh, what's happening in the Ukraine. These are things that are not happening, you know, the other side of the planet. They're happening to all of us and they're mm-hmm. happening now. So we must remain, I think, really committed as a, as a world society. Yeah. Last question for you. What, you know, given given, again, all of the events and the situations happening in the world and so forth, 
What keeps you smiling each day? Um, I love life. <laughs> Despite the fact <laughs> I feel that we're talking about these terrible things which are real. Goodness me. Um, uh, but I do love life. Um, I just think, you know, we are blessed to be here. There are so many opportunities in the world. Uh, you know, love is a wonderful thing, whether it's for our partners or our the families and the children in our lives or our friends. Um, uh, and we have many blessings. Uh, you know, I was talking to a friend earlier who said, you know, James, you're going to be asked, who are you? And, uh, you know, I believe that I was given a set of cards when I was born. Mm. And those cards are not perfect. They, you know, they include some things and other things they don't include. But I think it is our responsibility, being right here, right now on the planet, it's our responsibility to play those cards to the best of our ability and do the very, mm. very best with everything that we've been given because we have been given many, many blessings and we must use those blessings wisely. You know, what's coming to mind just from this conversation, and this is, this is, this is a first, at least for, for me, it's just I'm excited to tune into one of your productions with there's an there's the emotional connection, of course, with the show. If I and obviously I'm thinking of uh, the one that comes to mind right away because I watch it all the time. House Hunters International. There's the connection with the show and the content, of course. But I've never had this before, and I suspect many listening uh, haven't as well. To have that added connection, knowing a little bit more about the people that are behind those shows from a conversation like what we just had, and knowing you know, that everyone's doing everything that they can and, and people for the most part, you know, they're, they're, they're happy, they're thriving. There's an environment to support that. I don't know. That's just takes it to a whole other level that I think most people don't see. And to me, that's a, I think a big competitive advantage. It's, it's, it's almost like knowing, you know, the only thing I can relate this to is, you know, knowing the author of a book that you're reading, knowing them a little bit more personally changes the way that you experience that, that piece or that work. And, and I feel like I can only speak personally, but that you've done that for me here. So, Hey, thank you. But th- uh, a that's higher nice thank you for everyone. <laughs> that's, that's nice to hear. But you know what? I am, I am a creative by training. I've become a businessman. Um, and I care passionately about our output, our programs, and I can tell when the production comes from a, a happy team. I mean, to put it mm. boldly, yeah. um, it'll be a mixed team, people who are well looked after, who feel valued, who are earning proper money, who feel that they have a stake in the business, they've got longevity. I can tell. I can watch a show and I know that the way it's cast, the way it's shot, the way it's edited, it will be crafted with love, actually. Yeah, they will put their heart into it. It's like baking a cake. You bake a cake in anger. What do you get? You get something that's inedible. Yeah, and so exactly. so so too with any output in any business, whether it's television production or any kind of manufacturing or whatever you do. You know, I'll go back to you know my training. I, I spent some time at Stanford, where they talk a lot about culture, a happy culture which is properly diversified, a good mix of men and women representative of all of the communities that we live in, not only do they do better work, they make more money. Mm-hmm. So if you're purely being bold about business, you have a happy team, you're going to make more money. Yeah. So for me, these are no brainers. Yeah. This was fun, James. I mean, I, I, I hope this is the first of, of many conversations. And I, again, want to thank you for the time, but thank you for putting the effort, uh, into the book. I know, you know, it's not like you have any shortage of things to be doing with nine companies running, you know, in the background and, and having, you know, published a book myself. It's not the easiest thing to take on, right? So thank you for that. And, and, you know, a higher thanks for, for everyone listening that is about to, you know, experience whatever that next big event is. And thankfully, we have a, a, a pretty solid manual to at least start the thinking, uh, hopefully today. So I wish you uh, nothing but beautiful, beautiful success and, and a thriving, um, thriving day. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it. It's been great to be here with you.